Over many years of teaching, I've sometimes given a little break amid a you know, serious discussion about Milton or Dryden or Virgil. I've given a little break and told a story, which really is the most fantastic story of my entire life. And people react to it in various ways. One way is that how could anything like that have happened as if it were a work of pure fiction? On the other hand, some people look at it as a kind of mysterious, inexplicable story and ask me, well, what happened since then? And they like it's an ongoing narrative. So I wanted to share it with, with uh, you today. And uh, here I go. So when I was a junior in college, I was living in a, a small dorm on the edge of campus. It was the honors dorm. And the honors dorm meant that every student had their own little room, and I had one for three years. So I had a single for three years, and college students know how amazing that is, and I still look back on it with a sense of gratitude. And, and you kind of represented a field. In my class, it, case, it was I represented Greek and Latin, or classics. And other people did math, or physics, or chemistry, or history. And, and we had parties in this kooky uh, kind of weird assemblage that constituted this male honors room. We'd have parties every month or two at, to uh, celebrate our uh, brotherhood. And they would go late into the night. Now, I must admit, much to my own uh, derogation, much, and, and, and I'm sorry, I have to admit this, but I often did not have a date. Or I, or I didn't even work very hard at getting a date, and it would fall to me to be the disc jockey during these long uh, parties. It would begin at 8 or 9 and go till 3 in the morning. And, of course, that was the golden age of popular music. So we'd have giant stacks of vinyl records and two turntables, and I'd go back and forth from one to the other, playing Creedence and the Beatles and Paul Simon and, and Stevie Wonder and... and uh, uh, you know, and the, and the Eagles, who were actually new in that two year, two or three year period, and the and the uh, Stones and the Who, and it was, it, and, the, and it would be a remarkable night of music and festivities. And of course, that was not an age of asceticism and self denial. So people would become drunk. They would sometimes smoke marijuana, and, and I won't go into any other, but some, perhaps take some other uh, troublesome drugs that produce illusions and images, and in the midst of one of these long partying nights, I was sitting in the dark with a tiny light switching from record to record, you know, bad moon rising, switching over to, you know, uh, Honky Tonk Woman, and switching back to Let It Be, and switching back and forth in this way for hours. Enjoying myself, minding my own business, occasionally having a word with one of my colleagues or their date and having a relatively peaceful and enjoyable night amidst all the hoopla and the noise of the party. Suddenly at about 2 a.m., I saw to my right, I was sitting in a little folding chair in front of the turntables. I saw to my right, sitting in a chair beside me, a man in a dark blue hoodie quietly, a very thin, almost emaciated man, maybe 5'10", sitting in this chair beside me and occasionally glimpsing over at me, kind of suggestively, with a kind of, like he had a, some intention in his part. Well, uh, as time passed, I turned to him and said, I, I don't believe we've met. And he said, we haven't very grimly, we haven't met. Oh, I said, oh, I'm Blanford Parker, I said, and I reached my hand out. He didn't shake it. He said, I know, I know. And I, and he, I said, oh, well, who are you? And he said, I'm Joseph Adler. Now, at this moment, a tremendous flood of, of thoughts came into my mind because Joseph Adler known always as Jumping Joe Adler, was the most famous dissident and student criminal that ever 
was on in the Cornell campus. He had organized sit-ins and throwouts and set fires in the dean's office, and he'd been castigated and 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 exiled from campus. And finally, things came to such a head that he was ordered never to return to the college under any circumstances, and given an absolute, um, you know criminal dismissal from the campus because of his behavior. The day that happened, he crawled up to the fifth floor of the women's dorm and leapt out of a window, breaking both of his legs, shattering both of his legs, and he was taken to a nearby hospital. When he was taken to the hospital, his legs were set and they were dressed and pins were put in them. And, he was, and when he awoke from his anesthesia, he reached down and pulled out all the dressing and pins from his legs that had to be put into a straitjacket to keep from injuring himself. This was his mental position at that moment. Now, you must realize that he'd experimented very deeply in LSD and STP and psilocybin and God knows what else. And that he was in a deranged state during many of his political and social activities. And now I was confronted in the night, in the middle of this party, with Jumping Joe, one of the most famous characters in the history of the college. And he said, I have come to give you a message. And I was quite stunned by this. I have come to give you a message. And I said, what's that? What, what? He said, Blanford, you are one of the pillars of the universe. And I said, whoa, what, 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 how do I, what am I supposed to take from that? What, pillar, what does that mean? What, that, I'm not explaining it to you. You will be qualified to understand it by your own nature. The Lemurians have sent me to tell you this. And I said, who are the Lemurians? Well, they once lived in Atlantis in antiquity, they were the people of Atlantis, but they've now moved to a planet far away in space, and that's where I visited them. And I said, oh yeah, okay, that clarifies everything. So he said, I've come to give you this message. I have fulfilled my promise to the Lemurians. And he stood up and he walked away and disappeared. And I go over to my friend Tom Durham, who had been my co-editor in the, in the newspaper, college newspaper, and to Jimmy McFerrin, who a, was a close friend of mine, a history guy, and I said to them, that was Joe Adler, Jumpin' Joe. And they go, what? Because none of us had ever seen him. We were, we were, we were uh, freshmen the year after he was exiled permanently from campus. Jumpin', that was Jumping Joe Adler. Oh, my, yeah. This, the whole, now all of us were at a buzz about the presence of Joe and that I was a pillar of the universe and the Lemurians on a planet. And this was the story of the dorm, and it was... It was the next day, I was sitting on a couch talking to Larry Woodside, who was a skinny, very intelligent, skinny little chemistry guy. And he was saying, so who, are the, who sent Joe to talk to you? And I said, the Lemarians. I mispronounced it. I said, the Lemarians. And from down the hall, above the Coke machine, I, a voice came out, which turned out to be Joe's, saying, the Lemurians. And I, we were terrified by this. And, would, and, and Larry ran up to the third floor without barely touching a step and disappeared. And, and so Joe was there in the building listening to us. And then another day went by. And on the next day, it was May, and it was one of the or, or end of the semester and one of the first warm days of the year. And a garter snake had come up over the wood pile that was used for the fireplace out, outside and inside, and it had fallen over the windowsill into the living room of the dorm, into the lobby. And I found it on the rug, and I caught it, and I took it around, and I put it into the grass outside the dorm. Joe appeared in about five minutes, and he said to me, Blanford, you know that snake that you captured and put into the yard? I said, yeah, Joe, that was me. Well, this was, this was a disturbing message. Well, he, he was chased or disappeared from campus, and I didn't see him again after that event for an, another year. 
a year passed and I had become, by this time, a scholar in residence and I had a little apartment in a do another dorm and I was living and I came running home one day in the rain from the, from the cafeteria and I unlocked my door and I ran into, the, into my little sitting room and there was Joe sitting on the floor with his hoodie and very wet because he'd been out in the rain and he was like shivering a little. And I said, Joe, how did you get in here? And that was amazing because all the doors were locked on the inside and I, he said, that's not important. How I got in here is not important. The important thing is you are not fulfilling your duties as the, as the pillar of the universe. You, you just don't seem to be getting it. I'm here to tell you, you must move forward. And I said, well, Joe, I have no idea what duties or actions a pillar would take. He said, ah, now don't tell me that. I've told you this is your second warning. And he left out the door, gone. Next morning, I hear a great commotion in the, in the adjoining woman's dorm, and I hear loud cries and noise, and, and, and a, a, a Cindy Timmerman, a woman who, who was a freshman that year, came over and said to me, Blanford, you gotta come and help us. There's a crazy man banging on the piano in the, in the lobby, and I'm, I'm like, I thought, oh my God, Joe. So I go over there, and there he is, bang, 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 these loud, horrible, non-musical chords just whang and, and, and making groaning sounds like, oh, make horrifying, scary sounds. And all the women are hiding in their rooms, peering out through cracks. And Joe's making these bellowing sounds and pounding on the piano. And I say, Joe, Joe. And he, he looks up. He's shot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What? I say, you can't do that. You can't do, you're frightening people. This is not right. You've got to stop. And he stood up and he said to me, follow me. Very mysterious. Follow me. And so I did. And we went into the male dorm, down the hallway, down a corner, around the back, into the practice room where the musical instruments were for students to practice. And he sat down at the piano, an upright piano that was sitting in the practice room, and he started playing beautifully. I, I, as I remember, it was a Mozart piano concerto. And he's playing elegant, beautiful. I'm like, I said, Joe, you, you really know how to create music. Why were you making those horrible sounds? And he looked at me very intently and he said, Blanford, women cannot perceive beauty. They're not capable of that. So I wouldn't waste it on them. And this was just further astounding information. That same day, the campus police captured Joe again, reminded him he was not allowed to visit the campus and, and he was again exiled and went back to a mental hospital, apparently, in Bloomington, Indiana. And I never officially heard from him again after that event, except that many years later, uh, at least four full years later, I received a cassette when I was living in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, my hometown, briefly. And I was writing songs with a couple of my friends and we were living in this little apartment in Lancaster. And he sent me a cassette and the cassette had a little note wrapped around it that said, by now you should have been a talk show host in Central America. I had no idea what that meant and to this day I have no idea what that means. But we played the cassette and it was Joe playing the piano and singing a single line of and the single line was, I am the president of the world. And he'd sing this line and he would bang, 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 bang. He'd make these like jangling chords on the piano. And in between, I am the president of the world. And this would go, we, there was like three and a half, four minutes of this. In the back though, Dave Wharton, my close friend, said, I hear something back there. Do you hear that? There's something back there, and, I'm, and now we're listening very closely, and we realize that back behind, somewhere in the distance behind Joe, we hear Dylan's voice singing, and, and we hear in between, brang, brang, I am the president, we hear tangled up in blue, very mysteriously, in another room or another place. And that was the last time I ever heard of Joe, and since that time, we've never been able to figure out if he's alive or dead, and he's one of the great mysteries of that long era since that period, which was around 1982.